My name is Glory Turnbull, and I'm here interviewing Frank Condren, uh, avocational archaeologist and archaeological steward. Uh, to start off, uh, Frank, when were you born? March 2nd, which is Texas Independence Day, 1940. 1940. Uh, and how long have you been doing archaeology? Since about 2000, so it's now 2021, so it's been 20 years. Nice. Um, and were you ever formally schooled for archaeology? Not exactly. So this is going to be a long answer. Yeah. Okay. In the 80s, so I would have been in my 40s, my wife and I took a bunch of college classes for, for fun. And one of the courses we wanted to take was Archaeology 101. And we, they insisted the prerequisite was Anthropology 101. And we said, no, we're interested in archaeology. Let us, we, you don't even need to grade us, let us audit the course. No, you must take Anthropology 101. So we did. And we loved it. And uh, when we were up at the school looking for our grades, our instructor came out and said, Mr. and Mrs. Conrad, would you join me with the dean for having a discussion on archaeology? And so we did, and the dean says, we're thinking of eliminating anthropology 101 as a prerequisite for archaeology. And we said, oh, no, don't do that. <laughs> and we never did take an archaeology course. Now, since I've been an avocational archaeologist, I joined the Texas Archaeological Association, which is a very professional organization and South Texas Archaeological, STAA, South Texas Archaeological Association. Join those and I go to their annual meetings, which are filled with presentations. So for years, I've, I've done that kind of self-education and, And actually, the uh, S uh, TAS, Texas Archaeological Society, offers academies every year, and I've attended several of those academies. Plus, they have worked with experts for the last 21 years and, and gleaned a lot of experience from those people. I'm still an uneducated novice, but I know more than the average person. Right. Um, did you go to university for any other topic? Are you talking about as a, as a, for credit or for fun? Um, for credit, like, uh, what was your career, I guess? Oh, I studied mechanical engineering and, uh, at the University of Texas Arlington and got a bachelor's degree there. And then I later got a master's, a master's degree up at Wayne State in Detroit in operations research. It's an MSIE, industrial engineering, uh, operations research, which is kind of an obscure thing for, for many people, but it's, it's all about optimization is what it's about. Hmm. Were you born in Texas? No, I was born in the home of basketball, which is Springfield, Massachusetts. How did you move to Texas? What brought you here? Uncle Sam. Uncle Sam? Would you? Uh... I spent three years in the Army, and my third year and last year was in Fort Hood, Texas. And I liked Texas, and I would have been 19 then. I liked Texas immediately. And I liked it more when I met this gal in Waco, <laughs> <laughs> who well, I've been married to for, we're in our 61st year of marriage. Wow. And she likes archaeology, too. That's amazing. Um, 
So when did you move to Texas? Was it immediately after you met your wife? When I got out of the Army, my plan was to go back to home and make some money, and then come back to my girlfriend. And she said, that's not a good idea. <laughs> so as soon as I got out of the Army, I lived in Waco. What did you do in the Army? In the Army? Yes, sir. Uh, well, I started as a, it's called a rat man. It's an assistant to his survey crew. And then midway through, I got assigned to a graves registration company. And why they have rod men in that company is these are the guys that lay out the cemeteries. And when I came back to the States, there was a year in Korea. It's my middle of the three years. So my last year, I was stationed in Texas and it's a quartermaster which are the people who supply all of the material for everybody, clothing and pots and pans and rifles. And that's what Quartermaster does. And there I was assigned as a mechanic. And I'd never held a wrench before that. And it's interesting, when I did graduate with my bachelor's degree as a mechanical engineer, I was hired by General Motors. So I spent my whole career working on cars. I can build a car by myself. And, and indeed, one of the reasons General Motors hired me was they asked me what experience I'd had working on cars and I had done everything. Then. I had rebuilt transmissions and engines. And I did all that out of necessity. We, we didn't have much money. Do you ever find that you use your skills um, from either the Army or your education or your work with General Motors um, in archaeology? <laughs> the first thing that comes to mind is when I tie a string on a, on a data hole, I use a knot that I learned in the Boy Scouts. So I, there's things that there's things you do. You learn things in life that you don't even realize you've learned. And, and I, I could probably search for some more specific answers that are more specific to the army or, or to uh, my General Motors job. I, I could probably name some other things, but that first one just blows me away because every time I tie that knot, I think about learning a clover hitch. <laughs> when did you become interested in archaeology? Always. Always? When I was a boy, about 12, I bought an old arrowhead from my local museum that were, they were organizing, rearranging their display, and it cost me a nickel for this. I still have it. Really, it's a dark point. I thought it was an arrowhead, but it was a dark point. And that's why when you see, and my wife, in about 12, uh, about eighth, eighth grade, the teacher asked her what she wanted to do in life. And she said she wanted to be an archaeologist. And the teacher said, are you independently wealthy? And she said, well, no, she said, well, you need to be to be an archaeologist because my husband is an archaeologist. He teaches at Baylor and he doesn't make any money. So, so anyway, so my wife and I have both been interested in archaeology forever. That's why we took the course when we were in our 40s. When I moved here, I moved here in 1998, we retired. So I lived in, General, in Michigan at General Motors until for 28 years. And when I retired, I retired to Edna, Texas, which is about 20 miles from LaBelle, where LaBelle was found in Manport Bay, and about 20 miles from Fort St. Louis. And the, I moved here right at the time that they were starting excavation at Fort St. Louis. And so I went, they had an open house, 
for the lab. The lab was in Victoria on Santa Rosa Street. And I went to the to the open house for the lab. Took, I took my mother, who had since moved to Texas. And they were doing all the in, in an archaeology lab, there's cleaning or washing, sorting, analyzing, labeling. There's steps that go on in archaeology lab. And they were doing those. And I said to one of the people that was doing the sorting or the analyzing, I said, how do you get to do this? And he said, well, first you get a degree in this, and then you get a degree. And I said, you must use volunteers. Oh, yeah, call this phone number. So I called that phone number, and the next thing you know, I was working in the lab and digging at Fort St. Louis. And that was a great place to start. I mean, it's a big deal. And it's right in our neighborhood. And it's, it's a big deal in world history, let alone American history or Texas history. It's a big deal. Uh, the whole French settlement, big deal. Uh, what was it like digging um, and working in the lab for Fort St. Louis? Well, basically, I was taught what I did. And what I did was, I labeled. That was my job, to label in the lab. And so, everything I did that they taught me was, was new knowledge. And, and I listened and did what they told me to do. I label, label all these pieces of ceramics, and, uh, and that's where I learned how archaeology labeling is done and what, what you use. You use a certain kind of ink, and you use a certain kind of polymer to protect the label, and you use a convention for what you label and how you do it. So I learned all about that, and on, I learned all the rest of it. I did some sorting in the lab also. I learned basically what archaeology lab does. And when I dug in Fort St. Louis, I learned how you dig. They, they were, these were great. These were uh, paid archaeologists. These were professional archaeologists and volunteers. Well, I learned how to I learned all the things you do in the field. I learned how to screen, I learned how to dig, and what a unit was, and I just basically learned it. It was all, that was my formal training, if you want to talk about formal training, it was all in the field. So I understand that you're an archeological steward. How did you become an archeological steward? Uh, first, well, and let me back up a step. In, in those activities, both digging and in the lab, I got to know a bunch of local and professional archaeologists. I got to know a bunch of them. And the local archaeologists, two of them there, were stewards from Victoria County. One was Bill Birmingham, the other was Jimmy Bloom. And, and local stewards are always looking for, they, they have many jobs, but one of the things they're doing, which is not written down as one of their jobs, is they're always looking for people who can support a local archeological effort. And they saw that I was one of those people. And so every so often there'd be a opening for uh, new stewards and there wasn't a steward in my county. so. They turned my, one or both of them turned my name in to the Texas Historical Commission to be a steward. So I've been a steward since, uh, since probably about 2003. And what is stewardship? Well, I'm not gonna do, if, if my dotted line boss were listening to me, they would probably do a better job of describing it. But so let me just put it to you the way I distill it. It's, it's to, one, look out for the preservation of our heritage. And two, it's to educate people on how important that is. And three, it's to serve 
for landowners who think they might have some archaeology on their land, some site, or, or, or they want to know what the law is or something. So it's to support that landowner <clears throat> because our landowners are our best friends for archaeology. And you really want to cultivate them and make sure, and, and the law is very clear here in Texas. A private landowner can do anything he wants with his land. So, but, but what we archaeologists really like is we don't care necessarily what happens to anything we find with this land. What we want is the information. So we cultivate landowners for that. Okay, I was saying, what do stewards do? They educate, they support people who want to know if they've got a site, they educate the public. Those are probably the three big reasons. So kind of in that same vein. Uh, oh, and the stewards, by the way, we get training every, okay. so that's some more formal training, if you will. Twice a year, we have a meeting from stewards from all over the state gather and learn, learn some techniques, for instance, how to file a site, how to, how, how to get a place designated as a site. That, that's a for instance, but we do we do a lot of things at those, a lot of training. It's usually a weekend, twice a year. Right. Um, in that same vein, uh, what is responsible collecting to you? Is there responsible collecting? Yeah, well, re responsible collecting is, is it, the minimum is to describe what what you found, where you found it, and, and have that information accompany the artifact. That's the very minimum. As an archeologist, what you, and usually, that's that's something that's um, it's a surface find usually. Where there's uh, a landowner or a crew that's digging, there may be more information, like associated objects or associated context of the soil. There may be other information, but at the very minimum, what did you find? Where did you find it? And have that stay with the artifact. Otherwise, it's just a rock that ends up at a yard sale. And they are always rocks. So you mentioned that you had gotten a point um, for a nickel from a museum. Did you ever collect anything else? Early in our married life, my wife and I would go arrowhead hunting, and we did that with landowners' cons consent. Uh, we, we were invited to do that. So I have a collection of quote arrowheads you know, that my wife and I found. See, it doesn't cost anything to go arrowhead hunting. Those are the kind of things you do when you're when you're early young married. You do stuff that doesn't cost anything. And, but since since I've been a steward and since I've been associated with quote, real archaeology, uh, I don't collect anything. Anything I find is given to a landowner who's hosting me, or or if I, if if it's a dig, we have a museum where stuff goes. It's no longer fun to keep this thing. It's much more fun to remember its history and, and dedicate it and its history to, to some institution or to some landowner. So how did you join Cobalt? People from, they got to know each other around Fort St. Louis and 
and LaBelle. There's kind of a, a network, and it meant network sounds like it was an ongoing thing, but it wasn't. We that's where we met each other. That's where we knew. All right, so then it's around 2003. I live in Edna, which is 25 miles from here. And my neighbor brought me a bucket of dirt that he had gotten from a Victorian nursery and said, Frank, this is dirt I got from my flower bed. And look at the stuff in there. And there were artifacts in there and bones. The bones were all, uh, they were not human, but he didn't know that. And uh, the same thing happened over here in Victoria with Jimmy Blue, who was a steward. And Jimmy went to where the dirt, he got the, the exact same thing happened 25 miles away. And he went to the nursery from where the dirt came and asked them where they got it. They wouldn't tell him. But about that time, his truck comes in and dumps a load of tops so well. And so he follows it. And we, and at that point, when he did determine that it, there was a big site there, he called people that he knew would be supportive of doing an excavation because there were, what specifically, there were exposed human bones and the landowner had had to move the people doing the uh, mining, the topsoil had to move them three times because they ran into human bones. And so as steward, he knew, and I'm not sure if I was a steward then yet or now, but he knew we had to do something about that. And he got together, that, that's the network that coalesced. That's how it coalesced. And then after a couple of years of excavating together, one of our members, that'd be Judd Austin, came up with an acronym that was hokey, but you know, it stuck and it, we needed a name and it stuck. The Coastal Bend Archaeological Logistics Team. And, and, and it really, it's hokey, but it really describes what we do. Mm -hmm. And the site you're talking about is the McNeil site? Okay, okay I didn't get that. Uh, you're talking about the McNeil site. McNeil site. That okay. was where the, yes, that was where we worked together starting in 2003. The hottest day of August 2003 is when we started. Why the hottest day? <laughs> Bad luck? Because it was time to get going. That was, that was, that was when we got ready to go. And we had to remove, and we started with removing six feet of overburden. What I mean by overburden is the people that were doing the mining removed some soil, but it isn't what they wanted to send to the nursery. So they piled it up on top of where the burials were. So we started by removing six feet of overburden. Hmm. So by hand. Oh. In the hottest day of the year. I have a picture of it. <laughs> wow, okay. Um, that's crazy. Um, can you give me a profile of the McNeil site? Okay. Indians live where there were resources, one of which in this case was Guadalupe River. So the McNeil site, um, today, well, I don't know about, I don't know the extent of it, but it, but it doesn't matter. It, it used to be on both sides of the Guadalupe River. And the river has moved. But the river was there for at least 9,000 years that we know of because we, we, we can show 9,000 years of continuous habitation and by the right, by the river. 
So that's what you've got. You got nine. This is this is people lived here for nine thousand years at least, and they buried their dead. They had hearths. They made tools, and they left behind remains of the protein sources, the the, the, the parts that don't decay very easily. So that's that's a profile. Sorry. Okay. Um, what's your favorite thing that you found at the McNeil site? Found a groove stone. Um, it's on display in the Museum of the Coastal Bay. And it's basalt. First of all, there's not a whole lot of rocks uh, on the surface of um, upper Victoria County and probably lower Victoria County too. I'm just not familiar with that. So the source of rocks is, and there's no building stone anywhere. The source, the source of rocks would be in the Guadalupe Bay itself, river pebbles that have washed down. And so we don't know where this rock could come from. For one thing, it's basalt, which is very rare. I mean, we don't have, even in the cobbles that are in the river, we don't have much basalt. So this thing is about like this. And it's, it's only about this thick, but it's, it's oval. And it has a groove that's been cut in both ends. And to do that, would have required considerable labor. I'm going to say, and I'm just guessing, I'm going to guess eight, 10 hours worth of labor to cut those grooves. And we don't know what it was used for. We don't, there, there are, we have since found other groove stones at McNeil. But we don't really know what they were used for. But to me, it was, it was special. It was special because one, I found it, two, I know the time frame of it. It's it's a, it's an archaic thing. Uh, I don't remember now. I think it's really archaic, which would be let's say six thousand years old or something. We, so we don't really know what it's used for. I don't really know exactly how old it is, although we can come close by looking at other artifacts that were found at the same time at the same coordinates. That's my favorite. Right. So, how about another favorite? What's your favorite part of practicing archaeology? Doing it right. Doing it right? What do you mean? Well, Doing it right is there. There are accepted practices, and and also there are archaeology is labor intensive, both in the lab and in the field. And there are many ways to do stuff wrong. So we do a lot of redundancy. We take a lot of care to do things right. I just like doing it right. And the other part is. When we when we find things that we don't understand, that's they raise questions. That's that's the fun of it. But it's building something <clears throat> that somebody later may, with more insight or more technology or something, may be able to build on what we've done and and to know that they can trust what we've done as being correct. Okay, could you give me an example of something you found that you didn't understand? Well, my groove stone would be one example, but it happens almost almost every time. And by the way, it's this is such a fruitful place where we're taking the McNeil's Ranch. Um, almost 
every week, something will raise a question. Well, like for instance, we, we found a, a distal, about this big, it's a distal preform that we found last week that they were looking at in a lab this morning and it appears to have very, very tiny flakes taken off of it. And that's strange for for a preform, a preform, they're taking you, you're trying to work it down to something. You don't take off tiny flakes that actually gives it a kind of a serrated experience. Now, the point is it raises a question, and we're looking at that. What's going on here? That may just be use. They they may have used this thing as a scraper or something. But the, the point is it brings up a question. It, it makes you wonder. Wonder about things. It raises questions. So, what do you think the future of archaeology looks like? Well, I think technology will improve, and there will be things that we don't know right right now we don't know we don't know that we don't know <laughs> or we do know that we don't know and technology will give us more insight in the future so and i think archaeological sites are rapidly disappearing of course these are these, these are ex expendable resources so there'll be less of them so archaeology will have to get more, more disciplined than it is now. And it, and not have to, it will, it'll get more disciplined. What are some changes that you've seen in archaeology while you've been doing it? I don't know if it's real or whether it's just the fact that my awareness has grown, but it seems to be getting more and more professional, even by amateurs, than, than it was. And that, again, that may just be my perception. What do you mean by professional? Uh, what do you mean by professional? Well, when I was first, when I first joined the Texas Archaeological Society, I had fellow serious avocational archaeologists tell me, well, be careful when you go there. there there's there's just a bunch, some of those people are just looters and they're just trying to find where there's a site that they can go loot. I know, I've been a member of TAS and I'm, I'm the regional director for, for this area of Texas, for Texas Archaeological Society. I don't see any non-professionalism. I don't see any, it's, it's all serious people. Now, maybe in the past there were less than serious people. And in archaeological you know, awareness amongst the public is increasing. It's people appreciate it more. They are, they understand that we have a lot of people coming in for instance of bringing collections, and you can see people say, "Yeah, you know, I should have wrote down where I found these things." I see I see an awareness. Awareness of what you ought to do, what you, what you ought not do, raising, increasing. Okay. So, how do you document a collection properly? Well, I personally, personally, singularly, um, the only collections that I have 
documented were usually one or two or five. So what I do is, and the, the, the museum gets a copy of this. We, we have a little analysis sheet. Where was the artifact found? When was it found? What is it? What are its, what are its dimensions? So we scan a picture of it. And I, I do this, and copy goes to the, to the person who brought that one in, or two artifacts in, and a copy goes to the museum file. And I, I would say as a, as a lab crew here of COBOL, we do that same thing on a larger scale with, with a big collection. What's it like working with the members of Cobalt? Delight. Delight? Yeah, when you get to be 80 years old, you don't have to hang around with anybody that you don't like. We all like each other. We all respect each other. And one of the things that you, we have to do with a crew like ours is you have to be able to criticize each other. You, know, you screwed up, you should have done da da da. And, and I'm talking I'm talking about archaeological criticism. Or the next time you do that, don't do it that way. Use that bamboo when you get close to bone or, or a, a uh, vulnerable artifact. You have to be able to criticize each other. And friends can do that. So once you all came together to start working on the McNeil site and Cobalt was formed, were you all already friends or did you become friends by working together? Well, we already knew each other and we knew well enough that we would enjoy working together at the moment. But yeah, we're, we're that friendship grows. It just, we get to know each other's spouses and we get to know each other's family situation and we bring grandkids out to the site and 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 grandkids and kids. We we get to learn each other's strengths and weaknesses. We get to go to each other's funerals. Is that one of the more difficult aspects of working with Cobalt? No? Okay. It's not fun to lose anyone, but you like to go and support the family. We all care about each other. And we're all getting older. Do you think that Cobalt will outlive the people who are currently in it? No, no, I don't. But the uh, some of the younger people will go on to use what they've learned with Cobalt. We have a uh, we have some special people in our group. Who, when their talents are gone, their talents are gone, and and the and cobalt itself will dissolve. But the knowledge of the people who stay behind them, they'll st they'll still have their knowledge, and they'll. Perhaps participate in other archaeological endeavors. 